So good afternoon. I'm Hassan Al Hassani, heart failure cardiologist. So uh, today we'll do the first of three talks on heart failure. So I understand this is the last talk for the day, right? So you guys are ready to go to sleep. <laughs> so I, I know a few of you, and then a lot of uh, new faces. Um, I've always enjoyed coming to this um, you know, time for you know giving lecture and kind of get to know the residents and work with them. And you know, I, I always enjoy this, um, this opportunity. So again, I think heart failure is important to cover, um, not only because it's going to show up on your board, but um, you will see it as you see patients. Um, whether it's internal medicine, um, straightforward hospitalist kind of um, patient population, or on the cardiology service or if you when you finish and you know whatever specialty that you're going into you're going to see heart failure patients um, I thought I'll go ahead and and do one introductory lecture which is today um, painful lecture because it will be epidemiology and pathophysiology so that's my um, um, disclaimer um, and then the next talk will be chronic heart failure management where we can touch um, on the, the mainstay of treatment, you know, neurohormonal regimen and the, the data behind it and, and, and go over some practical, practical um, case scenarios and what have you. And then the last one will be um, acute decompensated heart failure. Um, and that, that will be a little more fun. Um, but you know, today, again, sorry, this will be boring. I know I'm, I'm only competing with the opening of the Olympics, so be patient with me. And, and again, a lot of, lot of uh, basic science, and, um, but it's, it really is important to go over these concepts. So when we next talk, when we touch on chronic management, then it will be easy to just bypass physiology and, and just go, go straight to the data and, and talk about the evidence-based medicine. Um, so this is the agenda, somewhat ambitious. I, I just you know, learned that it's 45 minutes. So I'll try to concentrate on the, the biggies and mo most important things. So definitions, and I put definitions because, as you will see, it's not just one definition for heart failure. Then we'll touch on epidemiology, uh, which is very important to understand um, going forward. Um, we have to understand how, um, w where we started, you know, historical, uh, historical models. Um, and there are four main models that I'll, uh, I'll mention briefly. Um, and give an example of each treatment that was available that era. Um, and then, really, the bulk of the talk, hopefully, if we can get through all this, will be the renin angiotensin and aldosterone axis. Uh, you know, you've heard about this m multiple times um, you know, during medical school and you know, your residency, but this is important. Um, this is basically the backbone of heart failure management. Then the sympathetic axis, and by that I mean beta blocker, the story of beta blocker and heart failure. You know, I, 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 was, I, I was interested in heart failure um, some 13, 14 years ago, and that was when beta blockers um, were contraindicated. And I, I came to understand why beta blockers are important in heart failure. And it's a fascinating story if you, if you understand it. And then finally, I put there cardiorenal access because I know most of you find it hard treat heart failure, especially when the kidney function is not good. And that's probably the, the most confusing part of heart failure management, which is how to, how, to, how to please the kidney and the heart at the same time. And I can tell you, you know, spo you know I can spoil this and tell you, you, you will never a able to do, be able to do this. So you're going to have to, you're gonna have to <laughs> compromise. But we'll, we'll talk about that. Now, uh, please take this as an opportunity, not today, I know not today, but uh, maybe next week, to go back and read uh, about um, heart failure physiology and pathophysiology. So this is just introducing you to the concepts. It's by no means um, going to be comprehensive. And again, I, I hate when I go to talks and, and presenters skip through the, the slides. I don't like that. But I may have to do that today because, you know, 45 minutes, so. All right, so definitions. So heart failure, there are many definitions. But this is the, the most elegant one that I found, which is the Heart Failure Society of America definition. 
it's a syndrome characterized by either or both pulmonary and systemic venous congestion and or inadequate peripheral oxygen delivery at rest or during stress caused by cardiac dysfunction. I like it because it has a lot of physiological uh, background. So it's a dynamic condition. It comes on ex exertion or it can be at rest. It can affect the right side, the left side. It, raises, it causes elevation of the systemic or and um, the pulmonary uh, filling pressures. Um, now, as you know, heart failure can be further divided into heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. Now, you're going to see multiple different, uh, uh, multiple different um, definitions here. Some people say reduced ejection fraction. Some people say low ejection fraction. Some people say preserved, you know, all kind of different um, names. But the ones that the Heart Failure Society endorses are these, you know, so heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, basically the same syndrome that I described the previous slide with this dilated um, big geometry that you see. Now, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, i.e. diastolic heart failure, um, again, the same syndrome, but the geometry is, is not dilated. It's, um, it's uh, usually um, thick and stiff ventricle. So this is filling failure. This is emptying failure. Now, by definition, by default, when you have emptying failure like this, you have filling problem. So you have systolic dysfunction. Most likely, you're going to have diastolic dysfunction. Um, and you can actually argue that if you have diastolic heart failure, certainly this heart, if it's that you know, small in cavity, you're going to have systolic failure. A little confusing. I have a couple of slides to show you um, about that. Now, myocardial remodeling is the pre precursor of heart failure. So whether it's uh, concentric remodeling um, that you see in uh, uh, long-term uh, pressure overload, uh, such as in hypertension or aortic stenosis, or um, a volume overload like you see in um, regurgitant lesions. Um, so again, the contrast, the same clinical syndrome with two different uh, phenotypes, if you will, or geometries. You have dilated on the left, non-dilated on the right. We call it heart failure syndrome. But each um, category has its nuances in management or what have you. Um, now, I hate ejection fraction. Let me just put that up, up there. I'm a cardiologist and I don't like ejection fraction because, it, all right, so ejection fraction, is it a measure of contractility by a raise of hand? Good. So what is it a measure of? What, what does ejection fraction measure? One thing, one, I'm looking for one word. I hear cardiac output, that's wrong. Volume, okay, so size, okay. So ejection fraction is a measure of size. Why is it not a measure of um, contractility or cardiac output? I mean, in a way, it is a surrogate measure of cardiac output, but I'm trying to make a point here, which is, let's go to the next slide. Now, first, you need to understand how we calculate ejection fraction. Well, I, I let you in on a secret, and those of you who, who have interest in cardiology and been to the echo lab and looked at how we read echoes, yeah, we're supposed to measure the volumes. There are ways and tools to measure the volumes and come up with ejection fraction, but we don't do that. <laughs> we just sit there and say, oh, this is 50%, 60%. It's kind of stupid. But that's how we do it. And, and nobody will, in fact, I was at UNC. The chief fellow there at UNC, and I'm not knocking UNC down, but the chief cardiology fellow, you know, we had this argument back and forth. I'm saying, you know, you, you should calculate ejection fraction. Um, if you can, I mean, if you have good border definitions and all that. And he, he's going, no, we look at it visually. You know, we should assess it vis visually. So there's some kind of pride in ejection fraction. Maybe because that's the tool of the trade. Like, you know, we like ejection fraction. I'm spending a lot of time on ejection fraction because it's important to understand that not everything is ejection fraction. The, the way we measure it is, it's simple. You know, the end diastolic volume. So you just finished filling the ventricle. You ended your diastolic phase, and then that's your starting volume, right? Now, at the end of your um, ejection, um, you put out volume, which is a stroke volume. And it's the ratio of the stroke volume to your end diastolic volume that gives you ejection fraction. So you get an idea now that you can have one of two things that can cause ejection fraction to be low. You can either have low stroke volume, like some of you say, you know, if you have low cardiac output, this is, you know, ejection fraction will measure that. 
But you can have normal stroke volume, but very dilated ventricle like the one I showed you, and that will give you low ejection fraction. So I can actually go through the exercise. We'll probably do it next, next talk. And I can show you that you can take two hearts, one the big that I showed you, one very small, and I can prove to you that one has an ejection fraction of 20% with X stroke volume, and then the other one uh, will have ejection fraction of, um, of 60%. And the same stroke volume. So, so just keep that in mind. Now, what is ejection fraction good for then? I mean, it's good for everything, but it's good for prognostication. You know, we, we have tons of data telling us if you have low ejection fraction, that's not good. <laughs> so that you can count on. But beyond that, don't get bogged down with ejection fraction. And I tell you why, because there is a tendency, and I still have that, as a heart failure cardiologist, when people tell me, you know, there's a patient with heart failure and multiple hospitalization, not doing well, you know, multiple comorbidities. And I go like, what is the ejection fraction? And they say 60%. I go like, oh, that's good. <laughs> but that's not right. I mean, that's, that's actually wrong because they may be actually sicker than ejection fraction of 20%. We know that about 40 to 50% of patients with heart failure have diastolic dysfunction. We have Mayo Clinic data, the largest data that we have, that actually showed that prognosis is as bad with preserved EF as it is with low EF. Now, this data has been disputed, but still, I, you know, I think it has some truth to it that you know, normal ejection fraction and heart failure is not a good thing. Now, heart failure is common. Um, you can see that over the past two or three decades, uh, discharges for heart failure on the rise. You can contrast that with actually decline in, um, heart in discharges for acute coronary syndrome, for example. And the reason for that is um, we have more elective procedures done as an outpatient, so not a lot of patients come in acutely, relatively speaking. Um, and then pa patients are you know, getting older. We have all these beautiful treatments and devices. So, so you see at age 80, the um, prevalence of heart failure is almost 12%. Um, so that's very important um, to, to address. Um, Medicare and, uh, you know, Medicare basically recognizes this now, and, and the, it, heart failure is becoming one of these diseases that Medicare is really paying close attention to, which is good and bad. It's good because, you know, I'm a heart failure cardiologist, so I like that. And it's bad because now, you know, hospitals and doctors will be, and you already know that, and the best practice and all that, are being punished, punished for uh, readmission. For example, ha how many of you know what's going to happen in October 2012 this year in terms of heart failure reimbursement? Do you guys know? Well, so if you if if the has okay the hospital get paid for heart failure admission whatever. So if they, if you send the patient home and they come back within 30 days, they won't get paid. That's it. So the hospital will be, you know, there will be penalties. So, you know, people are looking at heart failure as, as a very important uh, condition. Therefore, it's going to be on your board. <laughs> All right. Now, it, there's health disparity. We know African-American patients, you know, are affected by heart failure more um, compared to non-African, you know, uh, Caucasians. So just summary to finish the epidemiology. Um, projected about 10 million people will have heart failure in, in the year 2000. 30. Again, job security for whoever is interested, come talk to me. Um, and in fact, um, the, the, you know, the heart failure, uh, American Board of Internal Medicine just approved, when I say just a few years ago, three years ago, um, heart failure board as a sub-subspecialty sub, sub board, um, and, and this year will be the second time they offer it. So it, it's a very exciting time for heart failure um, management. And then it's costly, about $40 billion um, annual expenditure. So I hope I convinced you that this is a problem, not just you know, that you need to know about it for the board, but you know, for you know, seeing patients and discharging patients, what have you. So I know everyone is just so excited, you know, so we can delve into the pathophysiology and all that. So I thought this was just a funny cartoon there. So let's get into it. Um, now, before we, before we talk about, the, again, the renin angiotensin aldosterone axis, a sympathetic axis, and the cardiorenal axis, there are a few slides that I, these are like my pet beeves, you know, the basic concepts that you really need to understand before you understand heart, heart failure. So, for example, when we say heart failure, this is really the tip of the iceberg. You know, there are 
a lot of things that happened before that caused structural remodeling. So beneath the surface that we don't see or you know, we can't see you know, are things like uh, you know, bad sleep apnea, um, poorly controlled diabetes. And, and, and these patients, again, if you, do, if you look at their ejection fraction, it'll be normal. But then structurally, if you, take a, you know, if you do biopsy and you look at the uh, ultrastructure of their myocyte, you see fibrosis, you see, you, know, you see all kind of abnormalities. Energy starvation, what have you. So I put that there because prevent, prevention is key. So think of it and, and work towards prevention. And, and then, then I won't have the job that I am boasting about. Now, it always starts with an index event, right? Look at the ejection fraction. We, here we go again. We go back to the ejection fraction. So 60%. So this is a surrogate for normal contractility. And then there's something happen, ha something happened. So substance use or pituparum cardiomyopathy or long-standing hypertension like most of my patients, you know, or crack cocaine use. And then you, you lose compensation. I mean, you, you initially, well, I'm sorry, you have init initial injury, myocardial insult, and then you have structural damage, you know, performance goes down. Then luckily, organism will respond to that by activating all the, uh, you know, adaptive mechanisms. Again, RAS sympathetic, what have you. Now, that is good for, what, 10 years, 15 years? Something else happened down the road, and then you, you, you break that compensation, and you have, now you have maladaptive, maladaptive responses. So keep that in mind. Um, it's like the aortic stenosis curve. You guys remember that? You know, so you can have it for a long, long time. The same thing with heart failure. You can have it for a long time. Now, I like this so you understand what we're talking about because you know I'm going to keep saying remodeling, 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 and remodeling is, you know, you say I when I t talk to my patients I say, you know, cardiac remodeling, and, and then the wife sitting there, you know, thinking of the kitchen remodeling and all that, and I say no, no, that it's the bad remodeling. It's remodeling is bad, so um, it, it's the reverse remodeling that we like. So remodeling is going from that that elliptical shape, you know, football shape heart where strain and stress is distributed equally and to the spherical, um, big dilated ventricle. So that's remodeling. Um, now, everything happens for a, a reason. This is not a religious statement. This is just a scientific statement. So scientifically, we call this te teleologic reason, right? I mean, like things, you know, when you, when you have flu, you have fever. Why do you have fever? Because, you know, that's not good for um, the virus, right? So, I mean, so for heart, you know, why do you get hypertrophy? I mean, why, if you have hypertension? There must be a reason for that. Well, the reason is you're trying to deal with the strain and stress that the ventricular wall is subjected to. So you guys know Laplace law, right? So strain and stress equals pressure times radius um, divided by the wall thickness. So in a nutshell, basically, if the heart is a sphere, right, the, the the higher the pressure, the more strain you have. The bigger the diameter, the more strain you have. So the only way to balance that or adapt to that will be to increase thickness. So teleologically, it makes sense to, to have hypertrophy. The problem is hypertrophy stemming from pathological st uh, states such as long-standing hypertension create not only just um, thicker muscle, but then create all kind of chaos within the cell. So you have uh, switching to a fetal gene program, you have energy starvation, you have fibrosis, supply demand mismatch, you know, all kind of stuff. So it's unlike the physiologic hypertrophy that you see in athletes, it's pathologic. And, and it happens either in series or parallels. So the myocytes either put together in series or parallels. So you either have concentric hypertrophy and hypertension, for example, like you know, uh, um, onion rings. You know, you get m multiple, you know, layers of um, hypertrophy. So that's concentric hypertrophy, or eccentric hypertrophy. You know, say from long-standing mitral regurgitation, where it's volume overload, and and, and there there are explanations for this. But but what I want you to remember is two kind of two kind of hypertrophy or remodeling. Now this is a funny cartoon, and and it's. What is showing here is this is a monster, you know, like a scared monster, you know, just cold and, you know, just afraid of something. I don't know what it is. 
So there are two ways to react to this terrible environment, right? So you have functional signaling and proliferative signaling. So functional signaling is what we know, the fight or flight, right? So something that's going to happen immediately to, for the organism to respond to it, respond to that, that uh, danger. So tachycardia, for example, vasoconstriction, you know, these are immediate. They happen within hours or they, you know, hours. Proliferative signaling, which is common in, which is mainstay of heart failure um, pathophysiology, is more over weeks, months, years, where you have um, growth um, signals. And so this is just to illustrate what happens acutely versus what happens uh, in the long term. Just briefly to go over this, the, the basic problem here is, and, and the, for the reason, for, for the sake of simplicity, let's focus on systolic heart failure. So low output um, systolic dilated heart failure. What you have is low um, cardiac output, which results in decreased arterial filling. So the arterial tree is underfilled. So the first responder to this danger will be what? Your, your barrier receptors, right? Ventricular, uh, carotid, and, and uh, aortic arch. So the barrier receptors will sense this as low blood pressure. And these barrier receptors were built, I don't know, a million years ago or whatever, and to respond to what? Uh, animals attacking humans and bleeding. So if you bleed, you know, you, so you don't bleed to death, so you can clamp down, you vasoconstrict. Well, it's a milder, milder version here. But it's, you know, it responds. It responds to, to decreased blood pressure. And you know, over one day or two days, or if someone is lost in the desert you know, and, and you're, you're, you don't have water, it's OK. It's fine. It's adaptive mechanism. But then if you have it for months and years, it turns into maladaptive. So I put this slide to show how there's link between your uh, barrier receptors, central adrenergic center, if you will, your, your adrenergic traffic or um, output and it that that and its effect on organs such as you know kidneys and uh, vasculature now quickly just about you know how we understood not we but how they understood heart failure over um, you know years and you know 100 years so um, I start with withering right now I'm not going to go be, before withering so that that was in the mid 1700s um, the, the, the physician who, you know, used the digoxin. So it was congestive model. You know, people would come and they have dropsy. You know, they're really uh, congested. Um, Anasarca and almost like uh, your cirrhotic patients now. And the only treatment was digoxin and diuretics. And what were the diuretics used then? Do you guys know what, what diuretics they used? In, you know, 200, 300 years ago? Yeah, yeah, so what, what kind of metal? Mercury, yes, of course, they used mercury. For, I mean, it cured everything. I mean, it killed the patient, so it cured everything. <laughs> so mercury, and then, I mean, all kind of stuff, you know. Um, and then, of course, the hemodynamic um, era is recent. It's about 40 years ago, in the 70s. That's yes, when hydralazine, nitroglycerin, you know, and then people realize the afterload reduction is important, what have you. Then, um, then more in the late mid '80s, late '80s, neurohormonal axis uh, came to the forefront, and basically uh, anti-RAS um, uh, therapy and, and uh, you know beta blockers. And of course, over the past 20 years, more uh, molecular, cellular, cytokine modulation and immune mediated. So that's another way of uh, treating heart failure back in the day. You know, bloodletting. So you just kind of bleed your patient to death. I mean, it works. You know, you, you lose like two liters of blood and. You know, that's, you know, invasive diuretic treatment, so. And then um, you can view heart failure as pumps and pipes, right? You know, you have leaky basement, you want to drain it, you have a pump, you have hooked up to a hose, you know, if you drain the, you drain the back, you know, the basement, and you irrigate the front. So everybody's happy, but then if you have a, a bad pump, then you have a congested basement, and and then you don't irrigate. What is the problem with this model, to, you know, explaining what's going on with heart failure, knowing the physiology you know, of the heart? Why is this not going to be true all the time? OK, so that's one thing. 
Okay, that's another one. Okay, good. So you, you guys are coming up with all kind of, I mean, I can, we can sit here, we can come up with all kind of criticism. But the one, one of the main one is to, uh, you know, the heart is right side and left side. And the afterload of the right side is the preload of the uh, left side. And they're connected. And, and you have systole and diastole. So it's, it's a displacement pump, but it alternates. So, I mean, you know, this is not a good model. Um, now, you can do the model of you know, the engine loading up, uphill, downhill. So I, I like this model to understand preload and afterload, okay? So imagine that the heart is the horse, and then you're, you know, the work you're, you're going to do is take your, this load in the cart from point A to point B uphill. So you, know, so you have your contractility, how strong your horse is, that's your contractility. Then the more, um, the more load you have on the cart, that's the the, that's uh, higher preload. The higher the uh, you know uh, the steepness of the hill, the the higher the afterload. So you can you can now figure out how you can tr you know treat this. You can unload the you know the car. And so I mean that's that's another um, that's another uh, uh, model. The problem with this model um, is that these are connected. You know contractility, afterload, and preload. They're connected. I can make contractility look better if I, you know, have higher preload, Frank Starling, you know, so on and so forth. So you can't truly really assess each individual component. You can't assess the, how strong your horse independent of what preload you're going to put and stuff like that. So um, and I'll, I'll skip through this one. Um, just to go through the Frank Starling curve, what, what year did he live? What year was that? When, when did he describe that Starling curve? How about century? What century was that? I accept century. That was like 1915 or 1920. So that's fairly recent. Um, and the whole idea is basically studying preload um, and cardiac output and. Uh, understanding the relationship between how much filling the ventricle get and how much output or performance and there is neat relationship so you know this is a desired cardiac output that we want um, in normal subject uh, with normal uh, filling pressure you know so for a given central venous pressure or given preload you know we have this cardiac output so everybody's happy you know and you can increase your contractility, and this curve will shift up. And then, you know, obviously, as you increase your preload, um, you increase your contractility. That may not be as important for normal heart, but for someone who has weak heart, if you want to maintain this desired cardiac output, you can do it, but then at the expense of increasing your preload, and, and you have central venous congestion or pulmonary venous congestion. So that tells you that, that you can maintain cardiac output um, easy. Uh, and that explains why you know, patients with heart failure walk around and they're fine. I mean, they can do pretty much everything you do, especially if they're NYHA class one. But then when you ask more of them, they have poor cardiac reserve, and that's when they fall off, you guys heard that term, fall off the Starling curve, meaning that if you keep pushing that preload all the way to the extreme, you get on that descending limb of uh, Starling curve, and, and you know, your cardiac output it goes down. And then, of course, you have pulmonary edema. All right. Am I going too fast or too much, or is that good pace? Still have about 20 minutes. So. Now, renin angiotensin aldosterone axis. You know, th this should not be foreign to you. You've all, all seen this. You know, the importance of renin angiotensin aldosterone. This is your um, um, feedback mechanisms to restore intravascular vascular volume, to restore pressure. Again, all in response to arterial underfilling. Whether it's what you see in cirrhotic patient who has low albumin and they have low effective intravascular volume, therefore their RAS system is activated, or because they're bleeding in the emergency room, or because they have low cardiac output over years and, and their um, bearer receptors are activated or unloaded. Um, and they all start with renin secretion from the juxtaglomerular zone in the kidney that acts on the angiotensinogen that comes from the liver. 
it cleaves it, it gives you the 10 uh, uh, amino acid peptide, which is angiotensin 1, then angiotensin converting enzyme, which can be either the, the tissue that, or the circulating ACE, that cleaves it further into the angiotensin 2, which is a bad actor, because angiotensin 2, vasoconstrict. Uh, you know, it's a growth hormone. It's, va it's vasoconstrict, it's bad. Um, and then, of course, the angiotensin 2 stimulates the um, zona glomerosa, right, in the adrenal gland. And, for, to produce aldosterone. So you see, that's, that's a neat mechanism to may, restore your intravascular volume. Um, but then it can go awry. I mean, you know, if, if you have it for years, it, it turns from adaptive to maladaptive mechanism. And, and you see how ubiquitous angiotensin II, I mean, it affects all these organs. Uh, so truly, heart failure is a systemic condition, not just, uh, um, uh, just cardiac condition. This is just another representation of um, what causes renin release. And I, I put that here for, for one, one thing in particular, which is diuretic therapy. How many of you knew that diuretic therapy can activate renin angiotensin recept, you know, system or RAS? Did you guys know that, that, that diuretics do that? Well, this is important. And it's, it has lots of implications for treating heart failure patients, as we'll see in the more exciting talks next time. So. Um, Basically, these are, you know, th this is an observation that was made some 25, 30 years ago. Simply take patients who um, have either mild case of heart failure um, or um, asymptomatic left ventricular systolic dysfunction and just measure their renin, plasma renin, against control. And you'll see that their renin level is high. So that's just an elegant experiment to tell you that renin is elevated, therefore angiotensin II is elevated. Believe it or not, all these facts and, you know, that we take, you know, it took a lot to produce these facts and, and you, know, these, you know, this elegant work, for example, um, to demonstrate that renin is elevated in heart failure and it had tremendous uh, uh, therapeutic implications. Now, flying through this, okay, one take home message from this. If you give someone ACE inhibitor or ARB, don't think that you got rid of angiotensin II. Because there are a lot of other pathways that you can generate angiotensin II, non-ACE pathway. And that's what this slide is showing. You know, even here, down here, where take my word for it, angiotensin II is supposedly blocked, you still have high aldosterone level. And that's what we call aldosterone escape mechanism. And that has to do with non-ACE uh, pathways. And, and why is this important? Why is this important when we, we treat heart failure patients with ACE inhibitors and ARBs? If, if we think that there's still RAS activation, what do we need to do further? Good, so we need to target aldosterone independent of, so it's not enough to give ACE and ARB to treat, um, to, to address aldosterone, and we'll talk about that next, next talk. Um, and then I'll skip through this. Um, now. This is what I was saying about um, loop diuretics or diuretics in general activating your renin angiotensin system. And it does that, why? Because when you give your patient a diuretic, you're, in essence, you're volume depleting your patients. And hopefully you're doing it from high uh, total body volume where you're restoring their normal volemia. Then you're probably not going to affect their, um, their angiotensin system. But it's inevitable that you're going to overshoot. You've all seen, seen this, right? You give diuretics, you can't, the, especially patients who are sick with heart failure, they have very narrow uh, window. So you'll overshoot. So if you do overshoot, keep in mind that you didn't just bump their kidneys, that's the worry that we all have, but you also um, activated the renin angiotensin system. That's why the take-home message from that slide was, uh, I'm going to skip through the vasopressin. So the take-home message from that slide was, and if, if it's on your board, always pick that, ACE inhibitors or ARBs should always be um, used along with your diuretic regimen, especially in someone who you just, you know, recently diagnosed with heart failure. Don't just give them diuretics and think that that's, that's going to be enough. And you should concomitantly give them um, ACE inhibitors. They work synergetically. Um, now, moving on to sympathetic um, access, we'll do maybe 10 minutes on that and then five minutes on the cardiorenal axis. So this is a neat slide.
that summarize, summarizes why beta blockers are good. Uh, you know, and I can just put that slide up there and, and just make the case for beta blockers in any cardiac condition. So in essence, this is looking at all mammals, right, and their heart rate and life expectancy. There's a neat rela inverse relationship or relationship between life expectancy and heart rate. So the higher your heart rate, <laughs> The, the lower your life expectancy, right? And, and man is more, man, this is, you know, like man and woman, not just man, I mean like human beings. So, so, this, so that's a little outlier, but still follows the same trajectory. What does that mean? You know, some people believe that you have finite number of heart rates throughout your life, and it's up to you to figure out how to spend it. So if you take beta blocker, I take beta blocker for migraine, but if you take beta blocker, Maybe you kind of preserve, you know, there's some truth to that. This is not, it really is not a joke, it, it's true. You know, they put, people put that slide up there to talk about beta blockers and heart failure. Anyway, a little digression, but it's important. Now, so, but look at the plasma norepinephrine. Remember I showed you they measured renin level, and it was high? It's about the same time in the 80s, or early 80s, they measured norepinephrine level, and these levels were high. Um, and that's bad because it correlates with a survival. If you have higher norepinephrine level, you die pre, you know, prematurely. Um, we, we talked about this, the two slides here. One, notice here, um, negatives. So this is not working. Oh, so this here, the, the traffic, afferent traffic, in a normal subject, you and me, we don't have any, you know, our sympathetic um, traffic is, you know, sub suppressed, and you have equal parasympathetic, sympathetic, and of course it goes up and down as we go through our lovely days. But in heart failure patients, what happens? Look at this traffic, a lot of uh, uh, po yeah, a lot of adrenergic traffic, and that would would result in vasoconstriction, tachycardia, all of that, and that because that is because the inhibition that comes from the beta receptors. Your beta receptors and my beta receptors are constantly telling the brain, we're fine, we're seeing good pressure, don't do anything. But in heart failure patient, constantly telling the brain, we're not fine, you know, we're not seeing enough pressure, go ahead and activate adrenergic drive. So that gives you an idea about why beta blockers are good already, right? I'm telling you, too much norepinephrine circulating, and that's not good. Um, it works on the cellular level through the CAMP, more calcium, that's what I want you to remember from this. So beta androgenic receptors, um, you know, the G protein, remember G stimulatory, G inhibitory. Anyway, so that's the, the molecular structure of beta receptors. Now this, will, this is a slide that I want you to remember for understanding why beta blockers work in heart failure. Now before I go any further, anyone knows why beta blockers would work in heart failure? Just give me one, one idea. Heart failure, it's, it's a negative inotropic state. Uh, and you give negative inotrope, how does that work? Why would beta blocker work? And you can cheat and use what I just told you. Good, excellent. So you're looking at the macroeconomics of it, like you know the big picture. Yeah, I mean, so hemodynamically makes sense. Anything else, why would it work? Good, how, how would it uh, create reverse remodeling? Well, I'll, I'll tell you in the next few slides, but that, that's important, what else? Good, so they reduce renin, absolutely. In fact, that's one of the mechanisms people think that beta blockers work in hypertension. Nobody knows for sure why beta blockers lower blood pressure, but one of the mechanisms may be because you, 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 you lower renin. Anything else? What do heart failure patients that have dilated hearts die from, usually? Congestion or? Good, so sudden cardiac death. So by reducing the adrenergic spillover, you reduce arrhythmogenesis, and, and you know, basically patients live longer. But one p mechanism that is fascinating and that I want to talk about in the next few slides is this idea of down regulation of beta receptors. So as I showed you, there's tons of norepinephrine circulating, spillover, and the myocyte, the beta receptor, the membrane, is constantly inundated, inundated with um, Norepinephrine, so there's excess norepinephrine. So what is the natural tendency? Again, this is teleological. What, what does the membrane do here? It down-regulates the receptor. What does that mean? It hides the receptor. So your failing myocardium has l less density of beta receptors per square inch, whatever, than a normal myocardium. And that's a problem. 
And it happens because the subcellular um, sy system is all altered with heart failure. And you have, for example, this is the enzyme that breaks down the beta receptor. It's upregulated. So what it does, it, it really takes that, it takes that receptor and hides it. It brings it, first of all, it sequesters it, and then it internalizes it. So it's hidden. So see that beta receptor is, is all hidden within the cell. It's not responding to any norepinephrine. But even worse than that, you know what it does? It, it links to, somehow to the growth signals. So not only it's not stimulating it, it it's not possible to stimulate it to produce uh, contractility, but it's actually contributing to apto aptosis, uh, necrosis, cell damage through the growth, you know, maladaptive response. So that, that's the milieu we're dealing with. So beta blockers, how does it work then? Well, when, when you give beta blockers, beside everything that you talked about, you know, so you, reduce, you decrease the diastolic filling time, increase, uh, I mean, you increase diastolic filling time, you decrease the afterload, you know, you decrease arrhythmia, um, all of that. Then also it works at the cellular level. How does it do it? And don't worry about, look, don't look at the slides. So when you give beta blockers, right, and remember, how much beta blocker do we give in patients with heart failure? Do we give full dose or, or what, what, what do we do? Like metoprolol, how much you want to give my heart failure patient? Don't make me cry. How much are you going to give my heart failure patient? Metoprolol. Okay, go up how often? Okay. What, what is your goal, okay, what is your goal for, and we'll, we'll talk more about this next talk, but, um, so you're going to give very low dose. Why are you not going to give high dose like your acute coronary syndrome patient? Or more, yeah, well that's, that's a good point, but then what more concerning is, you're starting out with a sick pump, sick muscle, negative inotropic state, and then you're going to give negative inotrope. And that's where the, the, the confusion about beta blocker, how, how am I using beta blocker in someone with um, heart failure? And that's, I take you back to 1975, okay? Swedish group gave beta blocker to patients with heart failure and acute MI. Now, they did not know, any, they did not know anything about the, you know, the downregulation and all these elegant studies that just happened last 50, 20, well, 20, 25 years. They just gave it simply to reduce heart rate, reduce arrhythmias, and it worked. It didn't work, and, pay, and that's, that's the first report of giving beta blocker. Of course, it went for 20 years. Nobody did anything about it until 1995 when they did the first study, or 96. So, but it worked because of everything you mentioned and because you gradually, you gradually, they gave very low, low doses. You, you would draw on the adrenergic um, spillover. So the norepinephrine level, say 100, now is 50, then 25. So what you did now, the myocyte, the, the same membrane, is seeing less and less and less of norepinephrine. So as a positive feedback mechanism now, it's going to create more of the receptors. And, you know, the good news is these receptors are created not only more in number, but they're not linked to these bad signals. And, so, and, and if you stimulate them, so, you, know, you, you create good contractility. That's why you see more prominent response to beta blockers uh, in terms of ejection fraction correction or reverse remodeling than ACE inhibitor. Because you're creating new receptors, good receptors linked to good subcellular structures. All right. Um, again, as promised, I'm skipping through it. One last point about beta blockers um, in heart failure. If, if you don't remember anything about the beta blocker section of this talk, remember this. There is, especially when you're on cardiology service, so um, there's pharmacological effect of beta blocker and there is biological effect. In heart failure, we're looking at the biological effect, the one that we see after a month. It takes about a month to change the receptors. The pharmacological effect, I like it for my STEMI patient provided they have blood pressure. But I don't like it for my heart failure patients. I have to do it because you know, in order to get to the biological effect, you have to go through the pharmacological effect. 
So the take home message, and we'll emphasize that later, don't be obsessed with uptight rating beta blocker in patients with heart failure immediately, like in the hospital, like you do for acute coronary syndrome. This is big, absolute no. no. I mean, maybe you can go one step, but not more than that. Give it some time. Equally important, that's the last comment, equally important why you need to re understand this distinction between pharmacological, pharmacological effect is when they come back hospitalized and they're on beta blockers, don't take them off beta blocker because you're not going to get that good pharmacological effect from taking them. What you're going to get is removing the biological effect, so they're going to decompensate further. Now, there are exceptions. If they come in and they're cardiogenic shock, please don't continue the beta blockers. But other than that, continue it. Maybe two, two words or you know, a few words on cardiorenal pathophysiology. So on one hand, we have to give diuretics to that guy there. And then on the other hand, you know, fluids, you, know, you have someone, you give them diuretics, they you know, bump their creatinine, you call nephrology, and they come and say, who's doing nephrology here? Like, who's nephrology here? Who likes nephrology? <laughs> okay. Before I start, I love nephrology. But so you, you, you call nephrology, and they say, well, give them fluids. Or, no, give them Lasix. Fluid, Lasix, who knows? I mean, really, I mean, it's confusing. <laughs> it is, you know, like creatinine is up. I mean, how many of you have been in this situation? The, the senior resident, how many of you have been in this situation? Like, you give Lasix and you go like, what do I do now? I mean, and then, and then the doctor say, you better look at the, the attending. Better look at the neck and do physical exam. We talked about that yesterday. And, and, and then you go and good luck, you know, neck. I mean, you can't see anything, JVP. And, and then you're looking at the, you know, the extra external juggler, and then you think that that's JVP. You know. And then you give them more diuretics, and creatinine is higher, and here we go. And then dialysis, and what have you. So how, how do we take care of that? Well, anyway, you give them coffee, I guess. But uh, So listen, there's this, this is important. The con when I was trained in internal medicine, which was you know, 12, 12, 13 years ago, the, traditional, the conventional wisdom was, if someone comes in with heart failure and worsening renal function, this is low flow state. You know, these people need cardiac output. That's what it is, nothing else. And, or that we over-diurese them. Well, it turns out it's not as simple as that. And there are a lot of other things that can explain, explain otherwise. For example, if you instrument these patients, if you put SWAN in every patient that come in, that would be great. I mean, you can put SWAN and and by the way, we're doing more SWAN on the uh, floor. We're going to start doing that. So if you're interested, then you know, just come to me. We'll, in fact, we have one patient going home today that we did that. So that's a little you know, side note. But if, so if you, if you do a SWAN in someone like this patient that you don't know what's going on with, you, you will see that their GFR goes down proportionally with their CVP coming up. This is CVP, this is GFR. You see that? So the higher the CVP, the lower the GFR. Does that make sense? I mean, because it, what makes sense is if, if you're volume depleted. And I hate when, when I hear volume depleted and heart failure. It doesn't work. I mean, or intra, no, intravascularly volume depleted. He has heart failure, but he's intravascularly. It doesn't work that way. I mean, if you have heart failure, congestive heart failure, then you're intravascularly not volume depleted unless you over diuresis. But anyway, but here we're challenging that concept. And actually this is good data for you in the middle of the night. So if, if you have high CVP, that can explain, that can explain um, your pump and your creatinine. But how? Well, if you look at the predictive value of cardiac index versus CVP and telling you what's going to happen to the kidney function, the bottom line of this slide is, you know, this red line is showing you that CVP is better, has better um, ROC curve than cardiac index. In other words, if I had to guess and I want to know one value to tell me if the patient is going to do worse in terms of renal function, CVP is more helpful. If the CVP is high, if their wedge, is, if their wedge or CVP is high, mo mostly CVP, then their kidney probably is going to be worse than cardiac index. Now, this is exaggeration. It really is not that simple. It's a combination of cardiac index and, and CVP. But I, I'm making the point. And this was made almost 80 years ago. You know, isolated the kidneys of dogs. You, what you do, you tie the renal vein and you tie the renal artery. And you see that the urine output goes down 
both you know, with tying the renal vein and the renal artery. It makes no sense. I mean, you would expect it to go down more with tying the renal artery because you're not perfusing the kidney. What well, happens even if you tie the renal vein? I mean, you're not tying the renal vein completely. You're just you know, increasing the pressure here. Um, we won't go through this, but the, the, the bottom line of this is, it makes sense, right? If, if your kidneys are perfused you know, from the arterial side, right, and then you drain it from the venous side. So if you have high venous pressure, then your net a capillary hydrostatic pressure is lower than if you have normal right atrial pressure. So this explains to you why if you have high CVP, your kidney function is worse. Because it sh there should be a gradient, right, between the renal artery and the renal vein. There should be that nice slope. But if there, there's, I didn't put a slide, but I should have put a slide with this column being higher. So if you have high, you know, if you have no gradient, then you're not perfusing the kidney, therefore you're not filtering, therefore your kidney is up. Therefore, when you diurese your patient, you should expect improvement. So I'm leading to this final point, which is expect your patient's kidney function to improve if indeed they have congestive heart failure and they're in the hospital volume up. As you diurese them, they're going to improve. One other thing that we don't pay attention to is their stomach and how tight their stomach. Next time you see heart failure of a patient, you give them diuretics and they don't improve, and then their kidney goes up, number goes up, go look at their stomach. If it's tight, they probably have compartment syndrome, and you need to tab them. I, I mean it, so because if you reduce the pressure, you can improve the kidney function. These are all fairly new, or con new concepts in understanding cardiorenal connection. There is hope, so I mean, it's not just you, you just give them fluid or you know, call nephrology. Finally, this is almost the last slide, here's how I understand the whole thing. So remember the afterload and preload? So what is the afterload of the kidney? It's actually the preload of the heart, right? Because the kidney is putting the blood back to go back to the right atrium. So that's the preload of the heart is the afterload of the kidney. The preload of the kidney is the afterload of the heart. So the preload of the kidney is, you know, kind of, you know, perfusing the kidney is the afterload of the heart. So it helps you mostly understanding how if you have high renal afterload, i.e. the renal vein pressure is really high, you're not going to be able to decongest that kidney. So after all, you can actually call this congestive kidney failure, right? Like you say, congestive heart failure. You can also say congestive kidney failure. One word on this, and we'll elaborate more during the acute uh, heart failure talk. When you give diuretics to kidney, chronic kidney disease patients, you have to give them what? Higher doses, right? Because you have to overcome the, uh, max, you know, the, the, the ceiling uh, threshold here. You, know, you have to really give them... Um, uh, there's a secretory def defect, so you can't get the Lasix to their renal tubules. You have to give them high, higher doses. This is not necessarily the problem in heart failure. The problem in heart failure, there's decreased maximum response. No matter how high are the doses you give them, you may get hit that ceiling right away because of you know, receptor unresponsiveness and vasoconstriction, what have you. So the way to get around that is to give them smaller doses and, and more exposure to Lasix. We'll talk more about this uh, next time. So in conclusion, you know, view heart failure as syndrome, you know, different kinds, uh, different ejection fractions, different morphologies. Um, it's complex, you know, it's evolving the understanding of heart failure pathophysiology. Read about um, RAS activation and inhibition. I haven't y even mentioned, you know, like hydralazine or an endothelial dysfunction. Or, I mean, there are tons of things that we can talk about. Sympathetic activation, the beta blocker story is fascinating. Read about it. It really is, is important. And then don't be afraid of this cardio-renal interaction. The bottom line, I'm going to say what I just joked about a minute ago. Uh, bottom line, good physical assessment. I guarantee you, I swear to you, and if, you, if you're interested, you can come with me. I, I see some CHF patients here. <laughs> so if, if you take the time, you're going to be successful in finding out if they're, you know, five-minute exam, bedside exam, you know if they have congestion, if they're dry, if they're wet, if they, I mean, if they're wet or dry, if they're cold or warm. I mean, it's a quick five-minute exam. We should all be able to do it. Don't be afraid of JVP. It's easy, you know. And anyway, so I hope I didn't bore you. So that's it.
Any questions? I have a slide for questions. See if anyone will, is brave enough. Okay. 